Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. I'm American. I tend to be quite loud, so it might be the opposite problem with some of the noise. Um, so I wanted to talk tonight uh, a bit about my personal background. Uh, I'm currently a, a UX designer uh, for Google, um, but my education and background is actually in architecture. Um, so I just wanted to talk through uh, how I approach design uh, as a result of that education, as a result of that background, uh, and the way it's kind of influenced my thinking which hopefully will be uh, worthwhile. Fundamental principles in architecture. Uh, so some of these might sound very applicable to UX design. Uh, so this is uh, Vitruvius's treatise on architecture. This is from around 30 BC. Uh, and some of these features, you can see, are very relevant to our work now. So durability. Architecture should stand up robustly. It should remain in good condition. Uh, utility. Architecture should be useful and function well for the people using it. And finally, beauty. Uh, this is a really important one. Uh, architecture should delight people and raise their spirits. Uh, and I think this background, this kind of you know, ingrained mentality in architecture definitely influenced when I, when I moved over to, to UX design. So I'm going to walk through some of the things that architects obsess over and think over uh, and how they impact my UX design and also some of the, the trends I see happening in, in UX now. Kicking off with context. Context is a really, really big one for architects. They spend a lot of time understanding environment before they start building in that space. Um, so if they're building a new uh, building or utilizing a space in some way, what's going on around that space? What are the advantages and disadvantages of that space? They spend a lot of time trying to understand the environment so that they know how to design something that suits it, that enhances it. Uh, London is a fascinating city for architecture. It's just a smorgasbord of old and new. And every architect kind of working in this city has a huge challenge of kind of fitting in with the huge range of styles that have come before, um, but looking to enhance with whatever that they're designing and adding to it. Frank Gehry, of course, one of the most famous architects. This is his very famous uh, Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. Um, and he describes himself as a contextualist. He says he spends a lot of time studying neighborhoods and areas. Uh, the execution doesn't always get it right. Uh, Google Disney Hall uh, heat rays, if you're not familiar with, with that scenario, but that was an execution. Um, but here, this example, this uh, was, was designed to revitalize the, a rundown area of Bilbao. Uh, so he went to this area. It was a um, shipyard, uh, which was a no-go zone. Uh, and he designed this space very much uh, to, to, to attract people in, to be grand and beautiful and make use of the beautiful countryside surrounding. The curves optimized to catch the light and bring people in. So really kind of going for grandeur. When you go into the space, the atrium looks out over the beautiful surrounding city. You might not recognize this is also a Frank Gehry building, uh, admittedly earlier in his career. This was uh, designed uh, purposely to, to blend into one of LA's grungier neighborhoods. So he really went for a, a much starker style. He wanted this to be knocked back. It was for a graphic designer. And the inside space is quite, quite cavernous, almost sculpture-like, to allow the graphic designer to, to do his work. So context is, is really important. Environment is really important for, for architects. I can't talk about context and understanding environment without mentioning falling water. Uh, one of my personal favorite buildings uh, and one that architects around the world adore, Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright, built in the 1930s. Uh, it was built largely over a waterfall. Uh, and you can see uh, in the structures that he was making, it sort of mimics the waterfall shape, but in a much more geometric, clean way. Uh, and you can see sort of his Japanese influence. He, he really liked blending indoor and outdoor. And this house was really meant to reconnect with nature. So all of the surrounding views, uh, are, the windows are really optimized. And throughout the house, you can hear the running waterfall uh, that's, that's underneath the building. Context and environment can also be much more settle, uh, subtle. Uh, so this is uh, one of my favorite spaces. This is the Academia in Florence. Uh, and we always see pictures of the David in, in sort of all of his grandeur kind of looking up in this big dome space. Um, but we often don't look at kind of the wider picture, the promenade leading up to the David. Uh, it's lined with Michelangelo's unfinished statues. So these, these figures sort of half emerging from the rocks um, in sort of his abandoned works before he reached, uh, as you walk down, you see he, him reaching kind of his, his famous 
uh, David uh, on, it, on its Plymouth. And when you get there, a dome opens. So this kind of quite small um, hallway that you walk down then opens up. It's a very intimate space uh, and a really beautiful space. Um, and the architects really spent some time understanding how to, to make that environment work. Um, so for UX design, you know, us understanding environment, us understanding context, has never been more important. As we move into wearable devices, as we move into things like voice UI, and we're going into people's living rooms, we need to understand that environment really thoroughly. Uh, a project from a little while ago at The Guardian was designing uh, our first Apple Watch experience. Um, so we brainstormed lots of ideas. And we knew, like, the, the day in day life of someone wearing one of these watches, you weren't going to read you know, Guardian very lengthy articles on your wrist. That's just not what was going to be happening. We were thinking about someone waiting for a bus or queuing at the lunch line or quickly glancing through. And what we wanted to do with, was hit them with uh, one story that was very personally relevant, just the, the headline, uh, at any given time when they happened to glance at their watch, which they could quickly hand off to their phone or save for later if they wanted. We didn't have any of the devices, so we got very fancy with our um, paper prototyping. Um, what we ended up designing was a timeline which, over the course of the day, uh, adapted stories that were personally relevant for, for users. We knew in the morning people really liked hearing the news of the day from the editorial uh, perspective. So that was very much kind of editorial guidelines. Here's what you need to know that's happening in the world from The Guardian's perspective. And then moving on through the day, we made it much more kind of lighter touch and personally relevant in the hope of kind of grabbing people or, or helping them find kind of relevant stories uh, in that glance and flick through experience. It had to be super light touch. It had to be uh, super easy to interact with. And it was really important you always saw something fresh because we knew if we were stale in that particular context, it really wasn't going to work. So another thing architects love doing is model making. Uh, and I really enjoyed Megan's talk. I'm not sure where she is. Um, but talking about getting physical, architects love getting physical. So pretty early in the process, when, when you start understanding a space, you start working through your ideas, you start making things. Uh, and it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, this was one of my um, studies as a student of, of Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie. Uh, and as I started kind of crafting this space, was when I really started understanding it. Using my hands kind of helped me think. Uh, and it's where you start to understand things like how light might come in, how someone might move through a space. Uh, a pattern language co-author, Christopher Alexander, uh, got very close to usability testing. Uh, he would build houses out of cardboard and have people walk through them before he actually put anything in wood. Um, and in the design process, particularly with architecture, it's not the final model that matters. It's all of the scrappy models along the way. Um, these models would often take two, 300 hours for the, for the final results. And we had an architecture professor, professor who was loved and hated kind of in equal measure. He liked to go around with a sledgehammer at the end of the year and smash final models just to drive through the point that it's not the pixel perfect thing at the end that really matters, the equivalent of pixel perfect, the bolsa wood perfect, whatever we were constructing things out of. It was that, that iterative process where you were learning and refining and adapting and the models that were kind of half covered in glue and masking tape uh, where you were starting to get these ideas out. And I think that's a really key aspect of architecture. Um, the late, great Zaha Hadid is very famous for her very abstract sketches, her very abstract sculptures, which is how she started the design process before designing anything uh, that would be built. And it's this concept that ideas are not precious uh, that's really, really valuable in the iterative process. Getting physical takes away some of the seriousness in a good way. Uh, and I think Megan's talk illustrated that. It, it, it did a really nice job of kind of indicating breaking these things down, making them more approachable and physical uh, is really, really useful for thinking. I feel in UX, actually, we, we went through a phase of kind of pixel-perfect mocks. And then that kind of went away, got scrappier. And now I kind of feel the pixel-perfect thing is coming back, uh, which maybe that's just me. But uh, it's one for us to keep an eye on, I think, for sure. This is a, a recent uh, side project uh, where I started getting scrappy, started with uh, really investing in some paper prototyping. Um, moving into physical just helps me think. Um, and I've always loved paper prototyping. I think it's one of the best ways to work. Uh, and I used it to create a, a stop motion animation. 
This was for teachers uh, who struggle to remember names. One of the things they spend a lot of time doing is seating arrangements. So this was looking at how could we create an interface where they could automate seating arrangements and much quicker kind of move students around. Um, maybe tie it into performance to help kind of, you know, every day with how students were doing. Uh, with the ability to kind of see more in-depth information uh, on students. This is currently a very manual process, kind of manually drawing out seating plans for teachers who already have quite enough on their plates. So anything we can do to, to help speed up their process uh, and help them remember names quickly. I had a, uh, my initial idea was kind of a Tinder-like swiping idea, which very quickly went down very poorly with teachers, both because they don't want to be seen on the bus swiping students. <laughs> And second, because actually they, didn't, they don't have time. They needed tools that integrated with their current working process, not a whole new thing on top of all the things they already have to deal with. Um, so in terms of getting physical, uh, our, our Google uh, researchers are absolutely incredible. Uh, the team I'm on, Play Console, they spent a huge amount of time last year interviewing developers, sending surveys out to developers who we work with, really understanding those developers' needs, the things that they, they needed to achieve, collecting a ton of data back. They had 80 such needs, each with about a dozen data sets against it. Huge amount of information. And it was very impenetrable, um, particularly sort of for, for us coming to it who didn't know it inside and out. Um, so I worked with them. I was really keen that, that their fantastic work was accessible, that it was usable, um, and ideally that it was really visually engaging. So I designed these cards uh, with all of the data, uh, which basically could be used in workshops. They could be used with partners. Uh, and, and cards is just one solution. It's kind of a, um, it's, it's becoming more and more popular, I think. Um, Lego is another. Anything with Lego, I think offices should all just have Legos in their office. They're not expensive. This was a project back at The Guardian. We built um, a device wall out of Lego so that uh, we couldn't afford a, a full proper wall where you had all the devices stored up, kind of devices available varied. So what the developers wanted to do was when they wanted to check how a site was working responsively, they wanted to ping it to one design and it would work on all of them. Uh, but in order to display those designs, it was, uh, or in order to display those devices, it was very kind of messy on table. So we spent about 50 quid at the Lego store and with a bulletin board uh, and built a customizable Lego device wall. Flow and use. Uh, and I could add and light. Uh, this is another uh, area of obsession for, um, for architects, for photographers too, actually, light. But uh, yes, for architects. That was a photo I took in, in Paris of a street sign someone was having fun with. Um, so again, when architects come to a space, when they're in that phase, they understand the environment. They've started you know, model making some, some early ideas, sketching some early ideas. Key part of that is flow and use. How is someone going to use this space? Uh, what are their wants? What is it they're trying to achieve? What are the aesthetic desires with this space? Also, what are their needs? How are they going to navigate through this space? Some of the complex navigation. What if you're in a wheelchair? How are you going to get around? Some of the less obvious needs. If there's a fire, how do you get out in the middle of the night? Uh, and I went kind of from drawing one type of box in architecture to drawing another type of box uh, in UX. Uh, so this concept of kind of how, how someone is going to move through a space definitely influenced my thinking when I, when I became a UX designer. I think hotels are fascinating examples of flow and use. They so often get it wrong. Um, hotels drive me crazy, which is maybe because I have to travel a lot. Um, and staying in these things, kind of these, these faux marble lobbies, I just grabbed that off the internet, but uh, which we see so frequently, which is meant to kind of evoke this sense of grandeur. And actually what you want, especially when you're traveling for work, is kind of a sense of homeliness. You, you kind of want a sense of warmth, not, not grandeur. I think even for luxury travel, you still want warmth and homeliness. And then hotel rooms. Uh, you know, I, I swear, every hotel room, it's taken me at least, at best, 10 minutes to figure out how to turn all the lights off. Because the buttons are never in the same spot. You always have to unplug that god-awful lamp that's next to the bedside table to plug your phone in. Uh, and there's only one port, and it doesn't quite fit. Um, so, you know, there are examples of hotel rooms that are beautifully designed, but I'd say 95% of them really miss the mark. Um, on the other hand, this is our, uh, oh, the image is a little cut off. Um, details really matter with flow and use. This is our Google office in Beijing. 
And I thought this was just lovely. This is, uh, you have to scan your badge to go into the, into the offices uh, when you come back from lunch. And someone was thoughtful enough to put these little stands, because inevitably, when you're scanning your device, you're holding a laptop, you're holding a phone, you're maybe holding a coffee, and you're trying to pull out your badge and scan it. It was just a really simple touch, plus they did these like beautiful little uh, designs throughout the building, which were adorable. But it was really, really thoughtfully crafted. Someone really spent time thinking about that space, thinking about how someone was going to use that space, and designing for it. Um, I think in the world of UX, uh, understanding flow, it, you have to do a huge amount of research to, to understand it well. This is an older project that I did, um, but it's still relevant today. This became the most popular news story uh, on Facebook that year. It was about the world population reaching 7 billion. Uh, and what we did, my initial designs were just one long page. And what we found was people were much more comfortable going through this flow in chunks where they would give a little bit of data, so they'd input their birthday, and they would find out what number uh, person they were on the planet. I think it was within 100,000 uh, accuracy. And then they could go to the next stage, add what country they're from, add, what, add their gender, and they would find out a bit of personally relevant information. And this step-by-step -step flow was far more effective, both at getting people through the other reason this was effective was because it was personalized. And that's another trend we're seeing hugely coming out of UX. Uh, not a new one, but I think um, it, it feels more relevant than, other, uh, than ever. Uh, we've got huge ranges of experiences, and we need to make them personally relevant in order to, to help people get through them. In terms of flow and use, I think the kings have to be GovUK. I really, really am big fans of their work. Um, I think they've done an unbelievable job. So this page is one of my favorite examples. I don't know if you saw the UK bank holiday page before, uh, but it had an elderly gentleman at the top, a big kind of stock image photo of him relaxing on a beach, it looked like in Brighton. It had descriptions about why we have bank holidays and why they matter. And then there was kind of this table at the bottom with what the bank holidays were. They did research and found vast majority of people just want to know when the next one is. They don't care about any of that stuff. By the way, it's 30th of March. Happy Easter. Uh, so what they did, they completely redesigned the page. They dropped all of the stock imagery. They dropped all of the excess noise. And they just pushed to the top really clearly what the next bank holiday was. Really simple, really clear, loads lightning quick. And then you've got the upcoming bank holidays underneath that for you to check. I was at one of their talks, and they spoke about the fact that uh, if someone was on uh, minimum wage or going to a job for minimum wage and was checking uh, the information on a phone on their way to that talk, and they just really quickly wanted to pull out what is the minimum wage so they knew for their interview, they knew kind of the information. They did not want any nonsense to get in the way. They wanted that data to be super, super accessible. So they dropped any generic images of you know, coins or whatever you might put to indicate money. They dropped any fluff, and they just highlighted that data. So I really admire those guys. Engineering. Uh, so engineering, huge one for architecture. Uh, the, the role of engineering and architecture, architects and engineers fight constantly, but it's also kind of how the best work comes out. Um, the introduction of the flying buttress, first used in Notre Dame, or what, Notre Dame being one of the first uses, was a huge technological advance. This really changed how buildings were structured. So these very heavy walls, which wouldn't allow much light in, all of a sudden, these buttresses which would come out the side of the building allowed the weight to be distributed. They meant the spaces could be opened up. You could put in giant stained glass windows. You could put in thinner walls. You could put in more doors. All of a sudden, these spaces became much more airy. And we see these structures, the influence of these structures today. This is King's Cross, where I work, uh, which has undergone unbelievable transitions, uh, which has been fascinating to see. Um, technology really empowers architecture, and technology also empowers UX. Um, I think one of the interesting things around this is with next billion users, with more of the world coming online, we need to always remember not everyone is at the same level in terms of that access to uh, technology. We can't forget, as Londoners on our, our high-end Androids or iPhones walking around a city with 4G, you know, we're not the norm. Um, when we're designing for places that are just starting to come online, Facebook Lite really uh, sort of led the way here. Um, we, uh, we, we need to design far more resilient structures. We need to really understand those spaces 
Uh, at the BBC, I was very um, proud. We designed feature phone first. So we started from like the most basic, no JavaScript, and scaled up. Um, as we're design designing for these environments, we need to remember things like, um, you know, what happens to an interrupted journey? If you're on a ticket checkout and you're in a place with very poor connectivity and there's a five minute timer counting down, that's very, very frustrating. You know, how do we accommodate uh, data connections cutting out in and out if you're in a payment checkout flow that keeps things secure? Likewise, I think in, the, in, in um, places like London, we've, we've totally used and abused our ability to send notifications. UX designers quite rightly are moving away from that as we were discussed earlier. But actually in places where you wanna set your phone down because it might take ages to download, it might take a while before it comes back online, notifications are really useful. They can be really, really thoughtfully designed. Um, so all of these things, understanding technology and understanding technology in different regions of the world, really, really important. Uh, the last subject I'm going to talk about is one I'm, I'm really passionate about, urban planning. Urban planning is an aspect of architecture uh, which develops and plans uh, use of land. So it's really responsible for the infrastructure of a town or a city. It deals with roads, communities, uh, often uh, revitalizing areas that have run down. Um, so this is a picture I took from our, our King's Cross office. Uh, King's Cross has undergone huge uh, renewal. Uh, in the last few years. I think London is a, a really interesting city for, for urban renewal, um, or for, for urban planning, rather. Um, I, I think um, very often urban planners really think about the town center. They think about that high street. But actually, particularly kind of with Brexit mentalities and communities kind of closing down, I think there's a really important conversation to be had about borders how different boroughs, how different communities, what is the border interaction like from one community to the next? How can we start bringing those together? How can we make those high street spaces where you get more and more mix uh, of people and views? Uh, this is the High Line in New York, a really fantastic uh, project if you haven't seen it. Uh, this was uh, run down railway lines running all through the city which they turned instead to these beautiful walkways uh, and sort of general um, com uh, community spaces where people can go and just watch, uh, sit, and, uh, or commute. Uh, equally, it, it can go incredibly wrong. Um, this is Pruitt Igo. It was an urban housing pro uh, project from the 1950s from St. Louis, Missouri. I went to school not too far from here. Um, and this is not too far from where Ferguson happened. Um, it, Missouri has had um, uh, historical and catastrophic race division for a very long time. Um, and this was, this very much became one of the first ghettos. Um, by the late 1960s, this complex was internationally infamous. All, all 33 buildings were known for poverty, for crime, uh, and all of them had to be demolished in the 1970s. But it's very much remained an icon of what we don't want to do. Uh, what urban planning should not aim to achieve. And I, living in a city like London and looking around at some of the, the council blocks and things like that, I, it, it always reminds me of this and, and the potential to go down this road. One of the reasons I love London is on the whole, I think it really does try to weave different communities together. And I think that's so important. We're certainly seeing an equivalent in technology in terms of abuse. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a really, really tricky one. How do we handle abuse? Um, Alan Cooper speaks very eloquently on this. He speaks about um, the importance of being a good ancestor. Uh, for us as design and in research, we need to think about the decisions we're making in the tech world and the impact they're gonna have. He said something that really resonated with me, which is, you know, my trash gets picked up each week and it goes away. Well, it doesn't go away. It goes to a landfill where my kids are gonna have to deal with it someday. Um, he spoke as well about, you know, it's not the equivalent of, of the Titanic hitting an iceberg where there's, you know, one major event. Instead, it's a systemic problem. There are a hundred million pinpricks in the hole that result in the ship sinking. And so for UX design, for us in, in research, uh, you know, my takeaway from that uh, on, on anything that we work on is the same way we think about flows in terms of the optimum user case and responsive flows, we need to start seriously questioning how could, 
How could our designs be misused? How could our work go wrong? What is the expiration date on the work that we're doing? Um, now, this won't work if you're intentionally selling your data to Cambridge Analytica. Um, but on the whole, um, you know, I do think you're not going to have a UX crystal ball. Um, but the exact same way that architects have a responsibility to the people who live in their buildings, uh, we as designers have, uh, and designers and researchers have a huge responsibility to the to the people using our services. So that brings me to the end. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Uh, the question was, what made me switch? I loved architecture school. I did not love architecture practice. Um, I uh, worked in South Florida, and it was very much an uh, architecture of pop-on facades. And um, I think for UX, you know, we move on the whole, we move so much faster. We have the ability to iterate. Um, so I'm still a, a huge fan of architecture and really enjoy it. Um, but I moved to, to UX for the speed, for the, for the range, uh, and for the, the ability to, you know, once a building is up, that's kind of it. <laughs> I love that in the work that I do now, I can constantly keep improving what I've done, or trying to. Thank you. That was a great speech. Oh, thanks. And uh, basically, I find it fascinating of uh, how many similarities, like you said, there is between architecture and UX. And like, wherever you look, you can get inspiration of how things are built and how we can be influenced, influenced in how we actually build our digital products. So I was wondering whether there are uh, any other um, similar things in everyday life that you see that they keep inspiring you in uh, coming with different approaches or ideas in tackling UX problems, let's say, and for our users? Uh, tough question. Um, I think so. I mean, I, I, um, I love photography, and I love doing landscape and architecture photography, which I think kind of influences how you look at things. Um, I, I think actually when I most noticed UX is bad UX, and that's how I describe it. Like my parents still don't understand what I do. For a long time they just said I make smartphones smarter. Um, but where, where um, the easiest way for me to explain UX is when you get stuck, when you can't figure out how to do something, when you can't find your way um, through a building. And that could, be, that could be anything. That could be an experience, that could be, um, I don't know, a lecture where someone's nervous and not making a lot of sense. It could be, you know, an architecture space. So I think actually it's the it's the moments when I trip when I most notice um, most notice other UX influencers. Thank you all very much.